purpose in our hearts to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We're excited. We're excited about the call upon our lives, what we get to do in our service to you, for the grace to do it by, and the reward that comes from it, Lord. We just thank you now for your presence here. We give way to the Holy Spirit, our teacher, for an open world utterance and the flow of your spirit. We pray, God, that all the revelation that comes forth, Father, is pertinent to our everyday lives in the moment. That we take it as such, Father, and not a man. That your word worketh effectually in our lives and accomplishes all that you please. You declare to me that Satan and his operations are bound and powerless in our lives. And this ministry, Father, his influence is broken and removed. And we are living free through and by Jesus Christ, Father. We'll continue to live by your word and follow you in no freedom, Father, on a greater and a higher level. In the name of Jesus, we count it done. We give you the praise and the glory. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, good to see y'all here tonight. Joining us in person and those joining us uh, virtually. We're going to continue tonight with what we began on Sunday. This will be part two. Operating from a place of dominion and authority. Operating from a place of dominion and authority. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, on Sunday, we, we, we looked at a couple of other passages um, with Ephesians chapter 2. We looked at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. And we, we highlighted the fact that God has made us to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are all in covenant right standing with God. We are accepted by God in the beloved, in Christ Jesus. When God looks at us, he finds no fault in us because he's satisfied that the fault, that the sin, that the penalty of it has been paid in full. And he's no longer trying to extract any payment from us, nor is Satan allowed to uh, extract, extract a payment. He's satisfied, and upon judging us, he has judged us righteous. Amen? We are God's righteousness in Christ Jesus. We are the rightness of God. Hallelujah. And there, there, there's just a power uh, in, in, in that truth, in understanding that truth. We also looked at Romans 5, 17, concerning receiving the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of God's grace, that as such, we no longer are bound and subject to death. Death began to reign as a result of Adam's sin. But much more do we reign through Jesus and by his anointing, we who have received the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of God's grace. So as a result, we reign, we rule as kings in this life. Amen. Now, when you're talking about a country, a kingdom per se, uh, the king is the highest uh, seat of authority. Uh, the, the kingdom is where the king has dominion. It is the domain over which the kingdom has dominion or reign. Now, we are to reign as kings in this life through Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, and by his anointing, the same anointing, the same power that he reigned by, we reign by. Amen. Amen. And so now the third scripture that we looked at, which is where I'd like for you to turn today, Ephesians 2, we looked at verses uh, 5 and 6, and also we looked at a couple of verses in chapter 1. But Ephesians 2, uh, verse 5, uh, well, we started verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, he is rich in mercy, right? Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. He has made us alive together with Jesus Christ. The very power that made Jesus alive has also made us alive with him. Amen. Jesus was born again from the dead. Amen. When he, the Bible tells us that when he was made to be sin for us, he paid the price for that sin. So he would, he died, not just uh, physically, but he died spiritually in that he became separated from the indwelling presence of his father. So he was the first person born again from the dead unto life. 
and we were born again, quick and made alive together with him. The same life that he is alive with, we are alive with that same life. We are quickened together with Christ, right? By grace, you're saved. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus or the heavenly sphere or the heavenly realm, right? And so we actually occupy joint seating with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we looked at Ephesians chapter one to see the extent or the significance of the authority and the dominion of that seat, of that position. Amen. And so we see here in verse 19, it talks about the exceeding greatness of God's power, resurrection power to us with who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So this is the same power that was engaged in operational in Christ when God raised him from the dead. And so we were, we were quickened together, made alive with him at the same time, right? And he set him, set Jesus at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So we too are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. And, and, and now I hope you, man, this excites me. Now listen, listen, this seat of dominion and authority is the highest seat, the highest place or position of dominion and authority that there is, right? Second only to the Father. Amen? There's no greater authority that you and I answer to than that of the Father. Now you understand that the Father has, has delegated uh, various realms, levels, areas of spiritual authority, right? But ultimately, the authority comes from him. Are you understand what I'm saying? So now, this seat that we occupy, along with Jesus Christ, according to verse 21, is far above all principality, power, might, dominion. It's above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus the Christ, He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, the, the Jesus is the head of the church. He is Lord. He is the commander in chief. He is the head of the church, right? Right? And we are the church, the church. We are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. Amen. So if, if God has put all things under his feet, now the feet are on the body, are they not? They're a part of the body. Now, by the token of having joint seating with him, all things are also under our feet or subject to our authority, right? Every, every aspect, every area, every category of authority, power, dominion, might, principality, uh, that's listed here that, that currently has any, uh, li list, any listing, right? It, it, it's all subject to our authority. We hold the seat of a, of, of greater authority, greater dominion. Amen. And so all of these things being subject to us, they have to answer to us. We don't answer to them. Amen. Hallelujah. And then it goes on to say, which is his body? Being, being us, the church, the body of Christ, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, let me just read this from the message translation, just verse 22, and it might go into verse 23 also, I believe, from the message translation. Now, listen to this. At the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Now, that's an awesome revelation right there. The church is not peripheral to the world. Periphery means outside, the circle, right? But so, so, for example, uh, if, if it's, saying, it's saying that the church is not peripheral to the world, meaning the church does not have to, uh, we don't have to take the world into consideration in the way we function and operate. We're not peripheral to the world. We're not subject to the world. 
the world is peripheral to the church, meaning the church is the central figure. And the, and the, and the, and the events, the conditions, and all that is in the world, right, uh, is actually subject to the church. It's peripheral to us. So rather than the church uh, allowing the world to dictate to us and how we function and operate, as we come into the knowledge and the understanding of this place of dominion and authority that we occupy, we will begin to operate from a, from a, from a place, from an understanding uh, that the world is subject to us. We are to dictate to the world. That's our job. That's our responsibility as the church. We are the salt of the earth. Amen. We are the light of the world. Amen. So, so listen, it is the, it is the presence of the church yet in the world that's holding back the great tribulations. Because scripturally speaking, there's not one thing you could probably, you might could argue the gospel of the kingdom being preached to all the places of the earth. You might have a shot at that. But other than that, with the way technology is right now, there's nothing else in scripture that has to be fulfilled in order for the anti, for, for, for Jesus to come and take us out of here. Right? And, and the antichrist has always been present in the earth. He, he, he just hadn't been allowed to come to a place of dominion and authority because of the presence of the church. But once we're out of here, then there's no force, there's no authority, there's nothing to stop him com from coming into power, which is what will happen, right? So we gotta, we've got to begin to operate from a place of dominion and authority. Uh, the place, we talked about it in terms of, of the literal position we occupy in Christ, as in dominion and authority, but a place of understanding, our understanding, our outlook, our perspective has got to be consistent with, with the perspective and outlook that Jesus had when he lived and walked the earth. Are you understand what I'm saying? So we've got to come to a place in our understanding where we see ourselves in dominion and authority over all that's transpiring in the earth, over Satan, over fallen angels, over the forces of evil and works of darkness. We have to see ourselves as being in that place of dominion and authority because until we do, we're going to continue to excel, uh, we're going to continue to accept, we're going to continue to tolerate whatever evil that is present in our lives. And, and we'll take on the, 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 the mindset of a victim and, 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 and we'll begin to conduct ourselves as though we're at the mercy of somebody greater than us. When that's not the case. That is not the case. Amen? Glory to God. You remember when Jesus said, let's go to the other side and everybody got in the ship with him and the other people in the other ships followed him. When they got to the other side, you know, the, the, the enemy tried to raise that storm to keep him from advancing the kingdom. And, and that, and that demonet, de, demon, demon, demonic, demonet, the dude with all the demons got delivered and free. Right? Uh, so the devil, we, we, we know from understanding, uh, scripture that it was at least, it was at least 2,000 in it. Right? Now, the, 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 the head once was, was, spoke up and talked about we are legion. Right? But notice, he asked Jesus' permission. He asked permission from Jesus. He asked Jesus, don't send, them out, don't send them away, but let them, allow them to enter into the pigs. He got permission. He got permission. Are you following what I'm saying? Listen, listen, listen. Satan knows who you are. For the most part, he knows who we are better than we know who we are. Are you understand what I'm saying? But when we catch up, when our understanding catches up with the actual place of dominion and authority that we occupy, right? Then, 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 then say no help shot. It, 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 you know what I mean? He, he knows those. He particularly knows those who know who they are. He's well aware. Remember? Oh, oh, you want to come at me about this, this Jesus who Paul preached about? Oh, I know Jesus. And I know Paul. Well, who are you? Are you understand what I'm saying? And so, so God wants us and our walk with him and our drawing nigh to him and our fellowship and communion with him 
to come to a place of intimacy with him so strong, right? So, so, t- such that, 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 that his thoughts and ways become our thoughts and ways, right? That, that we, that, that we can say like Jesus did about his father, my father and I are one, right? And, and look, look, and, 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 and Satan will know your name. Satan will know who you are. Are, are you following what I'm saying? Okay, so, so, so we, we, we have to come to this place in our understanding in order to really be effective uh, in, in our calling, right? And so actually, uh, uh, actually, I, we, we talked about Proverbs 23 and 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, we talked about as a man thinketh, as a man believeth, right? Um, as he sees himself to be in his heart, so is he in everyday life and everyday affairs, right? So, so you know, the way we approach our circumstances, the way we approach circumstances in life is a reflection of our innermost beliefs and convictions of who we are. The way we deal with the circumstances that we encounter is a, is a reflection of how we think it in our hearts. As we think it in our hearts, so are we in our circumstances. The way we respond to symptoms is a result of who we see ourselves to be. Do we see ourselves as the healed of God, having victory over sickness and disease, or do we see ourselves as someone trying to get healed? Are you understand what I'm saying? The way we react is, is the result of who we see ourselves to be, of, of how we think it inside. Are y'all following what I'm saying? We, some, some, some news could come, right? Evil tidings could reach our ears, right? We're going to, the way we respond is going to be a reflection of, of our innermost beliefs and thoughts. Who are, you know, wh- wh- what, do, what do we believe? Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? I remember, uh, and, uh, Pastor David Martin years ago, his, he had two sons attended Virginia Tech when the guy went on in, in, under that demonic spirit and killed all those people up there. He, David, Pastor David had two sons up there. And he was teaching at, uh, at GW Danville. And many of those teachers had sons, relatives at Tech. And they were all frantic when news reached us what was going on. And they were busy going about calling and getting off work and this, that, and the other. And somebody asked him, was he going home? He said, no. He said, don't you have two sons at Tech? He said, yeah. He said, well, why aren't you going home? He said, if God can't keep me, what can I do? His response in the midst of those evil tidings was a result of who he knew he was, of what he believed, what he believed about his father. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So evil tidings should move us because our hearts are fixed and trusting in the Lord. But rather, we have an effect on the evil tidings. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? And I, I think I've shared this before. He actually had, one of his sons was actually headed in the direction of where the killer was and a, and a security guy cut him off before he rounded the corner. The guy was around the corner that his son was headed to. Hallelujah. Glory to God, right? So, so we've got to come to this place in our understanding of dominion and authority to actually operate from it, right? So <clears throat> we've actually, we got to realize, go to Genesis, we, we referenced this, but we didn't look at it. Go to Genesis chapter one. Uh, we are actually called to a lifestyle of dominion. It's, 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 it's <laughs> And God's going to hold us accountable. We're going to be judged for how we responded to this call, how we fulfilled the call, right? We can do a whole a lot of things that we all may agree are good things and right things, right? Um, but, but they won't carry weight with God if they weren't what he called us to do. And he's called us to a lifestyle of dominion. Amen. Look at Genesis 1. Look at verse 26. And God said, let the earth, well, yeah. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, right? Verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, 
created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion. He blessed them and said, have dominion. So, so in saying have dominion, he communicated his will to man for man to have dominion, but he also empowered man with the necessary power to have dominion. So, so words were used more for transfer of power than they were for communication. And so, so a lot of times, that's why our words matter. That's why we're either invoking a blessing upon our lives, depending on what we say, or invoking a curse upon our lives, depending upon what we say. Because through our words, we are exercising authority. We are authorizing the release of certain forces into our lives, into our affairs. Are you understand what I'm saying? So he blessed them and said he communicated his will towards them. And then with those same words, he endued them with the necessary power to exercise dominion. And that same endowment of power is upon each and every one of us who are in Christ Jesus. You and I are called to a lifestyle of dominion and we are endued with the necessary power to exercise dominion, right? Well, so what do I mean by exercise dominion? Basically, we, we are endued with power, and the endowment of power makes us responsible to do it, to see to it, to see to it, to see to it, that things in the earth are as they ought to be. Within the scope of our domain, within the sphere of our influence, of our calling, of our job responsibilities. So we, each of us individually, as believers, as the church on an individual basis, have a realm, a territory, a domain, so to speak, and, and, an aspect of, 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 of life and the happenings that are upon this earth that we're responsible to oversee and to enforce the will of God in. Particularly as it pertains to our life, our individual life, and then from there, it would, it would branch out to, to your household, to your, your, your spouse, your children, those within your immediate household, particularly under your roof, right? And then there are various levels and degrees of authority and what have you. But each of us have a domain over which we are responsible to see to it that things within that domain are as they ought to be. Are y'all following what I'm saying? We're to exercise dominion. We're to, we're to, we're to, we're to have an effect and an impact, right? Upon whatever conditions present within our domain or influence that are not what they ought to be, right? God is looking to, to direct us, work through us to affect change so that they become what they ought to be. And I believe the degree to which we demonstrate faithfulness where our own lives are concerned uh, determines the degree to which God is able to entrust even more uh, to us, right? The degree to which he's able to lengthen our territories, right? To expand uh, the, 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 the scope of our influence or, or our domain. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Praise God. So now look. <clears throat> Um, now, in light of, of, of Genesis 1 and 28, this, this, this takes us to Matthew 6 and 10, right? Matthew 6 and 10, you know, verse 9 talks about our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. When God, when God endued Adam uh, and Eve with, with, with power to exercise dominion, uh, the, by them actually exercising dominion, every time they said and did as God commanded, they were exercising dominion. They were walking in their authority, they were exercising dominion. And in each instance of obedience to God, the kingdom was coming, descending, 
manifested in the earth. The reality of God's rule, of God's authority, of God's dominion, of God's government was manifesting through Adam and Eve in the earth, exerting itself over evil conditions, setting things right, making what they ought to be, right? And so it was in Jesus' life, and it's, and it's to be the same in our lives, right? That, that, that we are to live and walk with God in a manner that allows God the liberty and the freedom to rule over our lives, to command us, to direct us, to correct us, right? And upon hearing his voice, we know his voice because we're his sheep. So upon hearing, knowing his voice, perceiving inside that God is speaking, we are to follow or obey what he's saying. And so in that we say and we do as we hear and see from him, as he commands us. And our obedience to say and do as he commands allows him the legal grounds to, 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 to perform or doeth the work. According to John 14 and 10, right? Jesus said, the works that I do, they're not my own, right? But the Father in me, the words that I speak, excuse me, they're not my own, but the Father who dwells within me, he doeth the work. So the Father who dwelt within Jesus is also the same. Go, go, go. Matter of fact, look at John. I, 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 I wanted to look at, at verse 10 in the, in the, in the passage translation about manifesting the kingdom realm because we as a church have a responsibility to manifest the kingdom. So manifesting the kingdom, the reality of God's governing rule and authority in the earth is is us having, is us exercising dominion, right? Now go to John 14, because we got to understand that we're not res responsible to, to do anything or make anything happen. We're, we're, we have a responsibility to manifest the kingdom, but within that responsibility, our responsibility is simply to obey God. Our obedience to God allows God in us to manifest the kingdom. So our part in manifesting the kingdom is to respond in faith to God's commands. That's our part, to respond in faith as opposed to respond in fear and doubt. Right? So if you found John 14, if you look at verse, verse 10, Jesus said this, he said, um, he said, he said, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The word, then notice that, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Do you believe you're in the Father and that the Father is in you? Because see, if we really believe that, then, then that's going to, if we really believe, remember Proverbs 23 and 7, as a man thinketh, as you truly believe in your heart, so are, are you, right? So are you in your everyday life, in your affairs, in your circumstances, right? So if we truly believe, that we're in the Father, we're in, we're in him, and the Father's in us, right? Why are we responding with fear and anxiety and stress in the light of bad, evil, unpleasant news? Why are we responding in fear and anxiety and we're in frustration at the, at, 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 at the, at the, at the price of gas? At, at the news of wars and rumors of wars, Jesus said these things are going to be. Right? Our response should not be one of fear, uneasiness, stress, anxiety. No, 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 no. Why? We're, we're in the Father. The Father's in us. How y'all understand what I'm saying? He says, so believe, he says, he says the, the, the words, right, that I speak unto you, I, I, I don't speak of myself. I don't just go around coming up with what I want to say or coming up with what I want to do. It's the Father in me. He gives me what to say. He shows me what to do. I obey. And as a result, he doeth the works. So Jesus is showing us how to exercise dominion. Just say and do as we hear and see from the Father. That's how he exercised dominion. Right? It goes on to say, in, if you, if you look at, uh, verse, verse number 12, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So, the, the, the works of dominion that Jesus, uh, performed, right? We are to do those same works of dominion. By believing in him, trusting and depending on him, obeying him, right? 
And, and we do greater works than those because now that he's going to be with the Father, see, he went first to hell, right? Paid the penalty we owed to the, to the point that, that God was satisfied and then rose up with all authority. So now in his resurrection state, there are now works greater. There are greater works to be done than there were prior to him going to hell and going to, going to be with the Father. See, the works he did we, when he, before that, we, we, by believing and trusting him, we do those same works. We're told in Scripture, we're commanded in Scripture to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to, to, to give sight to the blind and recover a hearing to, to the deaf, to make the lame to walk in the main hole. That's, that's on us. We're to do that. That that's 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 on the church. Same way Jesus did, we're to do it. But the greater works, the greater works, there are works beyond that that Jesus wasn't able to do. But be, but He made it possible for us now to do those greater works, because until His resurrection, nobody was born again. Nobody was actually born again. That's why he led those believers who were yet in hell, the captives, he let them free, took them to heaven with him. Nobody was born again. Nobody was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now that he's going to be with the Father, those are greater works that are now available and we're to do those greater works. How? The same way Jesus functioned in the earth, inquiring of the Father, listening and obeying, and then the father, it says here, the father in the, in, in the Lord do, does the works, right? If you keep coming, if you go on to verse 13 and 14, he says, whatsoever you ask in my name, and that word is ask is not a petition. This is not petitioning the father in the name of Jesus. This is not prayer in that sense. This word ask is the word demand by virtual covenant or the word command. And notice we're not asking the father in Jesus name. We are commanding a particular outcome in Jesus' name. And Jesus is saying, whatsoever you ask or command in my name, I will do it. He's not saying, I'm going to give you what you ask. He's saying, I'm going to perform and fulfill what you command. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you following what I'm saying? Thank you, Lord Jesus. He says, if you ask or command anything in my name, I will do it. We have a good uh, case in scripture in, in Acts chapter 3, right? If you see when G Peter and John came upon the, the man by the gate, right? Nowhere in that discourse do you hear Peter and John asking the Father in Jesus' name to heal that man. No. He says, I ain't got no silver and gold on me right now, but what I got I give to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He issued a command in Jesus' name, and instantly, he reached down and grabbed about, and instantly his ankle bones went, he received strength. Jesus performed what he commanded in his name. Hallelujah. Y'all all right? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, 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 now. So we're to do those same works, right? And greater works. All right, so, 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 what does this, okay, look at John chapter 11 in terms of, I want to help us, uh, mm, I want to help us by the Spirit of God gain some insight that we can practice or, or put to work and apply in our lives. Beginning right now. Beginning, beginning from this moment forward. You in John 11? Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about operating. And by that, I mean just going about our everyday getting up, walking around, going back to sleep life. From a place of dominion. The position we occupy and, the, and, and an understanding of the dominion that we have and the authority that we have. We operate from a place, of, we, we operate as one understanding. I'm in authority, I have dominion. 
we operate as one with an understanding, with a revelation that, that if I encounter something outside of the will of God, then I have authority and the responsibility to bring it into line with the will of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Especially, especially, especially if it pertains to our own individual lives, our own walk with the Father. Amen. So now you found John 11. Now let's look at this. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. So verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, right? Now, this is, this is the house that Jesus went into. Uh, they got news that he and 70 of his disciples were coming, and he went to the house. This is, he went to Martha's house, and Martha got busy with cleaning and cooking, and Mary took advantage of the fact Jesus was in the house and sat down and heard his word, right? This is the same two sisters, right? All right. <clears throat> so a certain man was sick named uh, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Right. So Lazarus is the brother to Mar Martha and Mary. Therefore, his sister sent unto him. Talk about Jesus. They sent word. Right? Saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Right? Uh, they sent word to Jesus. Their brother is sick. They all have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus has a relationship with them. You might could say they hung out. They're sending word to Jesus. Hey, Lazarus is sick. Now, is sickness the will of God? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And no, no aspect of sickness is the will of God. God is, is not at any time or in any way in favor of someone being sick and diseased. That's not his will, right? Sickness and disease is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a consequence. It's an aspect of death. It's a consequence. It's a result of, of Adam's sin, right? So, so Lazarus is sick. They sent word to Jesus. It must have been pretty bad because they sent word to Jesus to tell him, the one you love, our brother, he's sick. Right? Y'all follow me? Now, look at verse 4. When Jesus heard the news, he heard the news. He hears the messenger say, Lazarus is sick. And, and he says, in response to that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, religious, re, re, religion has told us that, uh, because the word wasn't rightly divided, that there are times where God allows people to be sick for his glory. And that's just a lie from the pit of hell. That's all it is. It's just this wrongly divided scripture. It's just, you no, know, no. That's not what Jesus said. See, this King James will mess you up if you don't understand. Because it's all poetic and flowery and all of that. But let me help you, what Jesus, let me help you understand what Jesus was saying. King James says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Here's what Jesus is saying. This sickness will not end in death. He's, 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 he's saying and thereby establishing the outcome or the end result of the sickness. 
He said, no, the end result of this will not be death. However, the end result, the outcome will be that the Father is glorified through the Son. You understand what I'm saying? Now, now we know if, if sickness is not the will of the Father, who, who's behind sickness? Satan is behind it. He's at the root of it, right? Uh, directly or indirectly, he's behind it. He's the one pushing it. Why? Because the Bible tells he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's coming to ruin and work destruction, right? Right? So then, so then, so then, uh, we know from reading this passage that Lazarus died. Right? And we know again that his death was the will of Satan, not the will of God. Right? So, so now keep in mind what we read in John 4, John 14. Did Jesus just say stuff on his own? Or did he say what he got from the Father to say? He got what he got from the Father to say. He said what he got from the Father to say. And he did what he saw from the Father, right? In John 12, 49 and 50, it te he tells you, I can, I can, I can only say that which I'm commanded of my Father. In John 5, 17 and 19, he says, I can only do that which I see of my Father. Right. So Jesus only said and did what he heard and saw from the father. So in the moment of hearing this news that Lazarus is sick. Jesus heard from the father. Those words and said what he heard. The end result or the final outcome of this sickness will not be death. Death will not be the final outcome. But the final outcome will be that the Father is glorified through the Son. So now we know if Satan was at the root of the sickness and his intent and desire, his aim was to kill, to bring death. And we know that Lazarus died. We know that was the work of the, of the devil, right? But God gave Jesus words to speak that changed the intended outcome of Satan. And the death that Satan was, was after, that he was, that, 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 that he, that he was trying to push, right? Oh, Lazarus died, but he didn't stay dead. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? Je Jesus, Jesus, they had a relationship. Jesus, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, they was friends. They had a relationship. I believe if you, if you look at scripture that, that they had, they had particularly, particularly Mary had a, uh, 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 had a great reverence for the word of the Lord, a great reverence. He, she highly esteemed the word of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, right? And, 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 and so, this is not just Jesus ministering healing to somebody that heard about Jesus. These are people who had a relationship with Jesus. Are you understand what I'm saying? And, and I'm, and I'm saying, and, and because see, relationships matter because the nature of the relationship can, can bring someone within the domain or the scope of the authority on the one in whom their relationship will that they can benefit from. Y'all see what I'm saying? So, 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 so upon listening and inquiring, Jesus said, oh, oh he, he understood, he may or may not have understood, uh, how bad off Lazarus was. But see, that's the thing. We don't, See, God give you something to say. Don't, don't, don't bring it into reasoning and question it. Oh, what, what sense did that make? No. If he's telling you to say something, it needs to be said because it's going to give him the grounds to perform it. To perform a thing he wants done. Right? And so, so, so Jesus altered Satan's agenda. So when he said this was not going to end in death, but, it, but I'm going to be glorified. The Father's going to be glorified by me. What was happening? The kingdom was coming. The reality of, of God's rule and authority was coming, descending from the heavens, manifesting in the earth 
over those present evil conditions of that impending death and sickness, right? Setting things right. Making them what they ought to be. Are you understand what I'm saying? Now, if you find, you, 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 you keep reading here, you find that, that Jesus waited there another two days before traveling, uh, to, to, to go see Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And by the time he, he's there, okay, Lazarus has died. Now, Jesus knows that he has died before he leaves going, going there. Right? Matter of fact, look at you in John 11. Look, look, Jesus is trying to, trying to, uh, say, okay, Lazarus is asleep, but we go to wake him and they, they didn't, they wasn't getting it. Well, if he sleep, Lord, let him sleep. He, he, all right, let him sleep. Don't go wake him up. So finally, if you see in verse 14, he says, Lazarus is dead. And that's the King James. In the original Greek, he didn't say Lazarus is dead. He said Lazarus, Lazarus died. See, those are two different things. To say someone is dead, Okay, did Jesus die? Jesus died, right? But is Jesus dead? No, 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 no. So he, Jesus is acknowledging and, and giving them from a factual perspective, from the natural realm, he died. And he was using the word sleep. But he said, I go to wake him up. Or I, I'm going there so he won't remain dead. I'm going there to exercise dominion over this present evil condition and set the thing right. I'm going there because this is what I've heard and seen from my father to say and do. Are you understand what I'm saying? And so he gets there and obviously, you know, he finds out where, 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 where Lazarus is. He's in the tomb and, and he, Lazarus, come forth! Right? And, and the Bible says that he was, he was bound in, in, in the grave clothes, wrapped up, right? I wonder how he came for. Because if he, he couldn't walk, would he hop out? In my imagination, he just never came. Just, just, just came forth. Glory to God. I understand what I'm saying. Come forth. See, what, what has the appearance of being dead and, and, and too far gone in your life? You can resurrect it. You can breathe and speak new life into that situation, into that body part, into that bank account, into that relationship, whatever it is that appears dead, unproductive, right? Even those things that say, well, it's just too far gone. No, 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 no. Find out from God what his will is concerning the thing. What God has to say about it or gives you to say about the thing and start saying what God says. Find out from God what he would have you to do, what action to take, and then obey God. And dominate the thing. Are you understand what I'm saying? So again, I want to clear, clarify. This is not to say, because you don't see Jesus doing this. Jesus didn't go, you, you don't see Jesus just Doing this all the time. But it's as he heard and saw from the father. Came upon a funeral procession one time. Boom! Raised the dude up out the coffin. But he heard and he saw. Right? He heard and saw. So, so the point I'm trying to help us understand with this, let's, let's now think about us on this side of the cross and our everyday life affairs, right? Whatever Whatever is going on in your life, your life, that means it's within your domain. It's within your sphere of influence. That means it's subject to your authority, which means you can exercise dominion over it, right? So whatever's presently going on in your life that's not the will of God, that's not consistent with the word of God, the promises of God, the plan of God for you specifically, Whatever's present that shouldn't be, that's out of order, off in any way, you got to remember, it's subject to your authority. You don't have to accept it. You can go to the Father, get what he has, what he would tell you to say and do, and obey, and dominate that situation. Glory to God. 
Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so, so just as an example, the testimony I think is sitting at this point, I've shared it before. But years ago, years ago before our children were married, me and my wife's getting ready, getting dressed, getting ready to go out of town, join some friends for dinner in Petersburg. I, I'm in the next room. Ah! I hear a, a, a ouch and ah. I, I go in, wife in tears. She done dropped the curt hot comb and in, in reflex, she grabbed it and caught it by the hot piece and her, and her, and her, and her, and her arm, her hand was uh, singed, the skin was uh, blemished and red and all that kind of stuff, right? I, I, all I hear is the, the holler. I go in there, I see, the, I see all that, and I, I go back down the hall, and I'm thinking, Lord, did this out not me? I said, how did this out? I said, what did I do? He said, take authority. I heard take authority, right? So if we're going to do like Jesus, then what I'm supposed to say is going to be an expression of authority. Take authority. What I did was what I saw. Or what, when I heard the words take authority, the visual image came into my mind, go in there, lay hands on and, and tell the pain to go. That's what I heard, that's what I saw, that's what I did. Grab the hand, pain, go! In the name of Jesus. Went back down the hall. I'm not responsible for nothing else after that. My responsibility is to respond in faith. We're talking about our ability to respond in faith. Responsibility, our ability to respond, right? I heard, I saw, I obeyed. I went down the hall. She followed me down the hall in a few seconds. Said, "When you, when you, when you, uh, smack my hand, told the pain, the pain left, all the burn, all left, left instantly, right?" She finished getting dressed and everything. We we left. And stopped in dam along the way, got some cream and some gall. She wrapped it up because, you know, the skin was blemished and red and all that kind of stuff. Got on to uh, Petersburg, had dinner. Later that, about later, the, the thing was all loose, you know, so she took it off and going to redo it. And, and it's all completely gone. The blemish, this red skin, uh, it, you, there's no trace that she was burned. That, that's exercising the moon. Are you understand what I'm saying? My wife is within my domain. Within the sphere of my influence, the scope of my calling. Husbands, our children are within our domain. You know, now they come of age when they become accountable and responsible for their own actions, but you understand what I'm saying? There's still a, a measure of, of effect that we can have because of the nature of the relationship, particularly if they submit themselves to it. Are you understand what I'm saying? So that's exercise dominion on a personal level, right? But now this thing can, can increase and expand, uh, and will increase and expand as we continue to demonstrate faithfulness over our current level, our current domain, our current sphere of influence, right? Y'all follow what I'm saying? Y'all, y'all get me? Because see, because see, remember, the church is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. The church doesn't have to answer to the world. The, 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 the church is not dictated to by the world, but the world is to, the church is to dictate to the world and establish what is, what is right and just. Right? Are y'all understand what I'm saying? So, you might remember, you might recall me sharing this testimony before, but I, I'm, I'm going to share it again, and I actually Looked it up to see if I could find it, the actual one, and I did. Praise God. The, uh, and if you want to look it up yourself, this is, the, you can find it under this heading. It says, meet the man who challenged the meeting of world witches and wizards in Nigeria. Now, this happened a number of years ago. A number, I, I, I wasn't able to find the exact date. I, it might be in there. I didn't read it that closely. But this is about a man. He is, his, he is the archbishop of their fellowship. I think he's been going home with the Lord now. But his name was Benson Idahosa, I-D-A-H-O-S-A. Archbishop Benson Idahosa, right? Meet the man who challenged the meeting of world riches, witches, world witches and wizards in Nigeria. Now, Archbishop, right? Bible talks about, you know, bishops 
apostles, you know, they can be uh, kind of interchanged just depending on who's using the term. But we're talking, but ultimately we're talking about, uh, we're talking about a believer. We're talking about a man of God who over the years of faithfulness, God had elevated to a level of authority and oversight over several other churches. And in this case, even over a territory. I, I believe that God establishes ministries and, and eventually he promotes and, in, and elevates them to where they have, they, they have a territorial oversight. Glory to God. Are you following what I'm saying? Y'all get with me? And it's real life. This really happened. Okay? So, so what happened was uh, news got out that these people, well, well let me tell you, First of all, Benson Idahosa, uh, you remember Bishop David Oedipo, right? Okay, so David Oedipo had, now at this time has the largest uh, sanctuary on the planet. It, 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 it seats 55,000, right? And they got three services a day, plus two overflow tents that hold 20,000 each. But prior to this, this particular guy had just finished overseeing the construction and the building of the of the biggest uh, church arena in the world, right? And it was in uh, Nigeria, right? So a few months after the dedication, they call it the faith arena. It says here, a few months after the dedication of the faith arena, a news circulated Nigeria uh, that witches all over the world had met in the state of Chicago of the United States, and they decided they were going to hold their first international conference in Nigeria, right, in in the city of Benin, right, with their um, with their chief host being in, being somebody from that city, right. So uh, they had they had a live conference on Nigeria uh, TV about this this global international conference for witches and wizards that is going to be held, right? Now, now, you, now, now you understand what I'm saying. We ain't talking about a few people in a hut down the street. We talking about global, international, after already having one in the United States, they having a global, international conference for witches and wizards. Now, a lot of times we see that stuff on TV and then we say, well, it ain't, it ain't real. A lot of stuff you see on TV ain't real, but there are real wizards and, and witches. There are people who actually worship Satan. I'm not talking about just sinners who don't know God. They, are, they, they on purpose deliberately worship Satan. You understand? So they got this conference plan and they, they got, they, they didn't advertise it on Nigerian TV. A few months after the faith arena uh, has built, right? So uh, they're talking about how it wasn't a coincidence or what have you. And so the news, the news broke. So, so when Ar the Archbishop Idahosa heard it, he said on a TV program um, called Idahosa and You, a program of, of part of his world outreach, he said, uh, it could not be true that they were going to have this conference. He said it can't be true. It could not be true because it's not possible. He said, no, that can't be true. Get, get, get the text and get the content. He's saying, oh, they're going to have a conference? In a no, it can't be true. Well, why not, Bishop? Because it's not possible. They already had one. But he's saying it's not true. They're not going to have one because it's not possible. Right? You follow me? He said it. Just, just like Jesus, when he heard about Lazarus, said it, he, he changed the outcome of the thing. I the host heard and changed the outcome. Nope, that's, that can't be true. Because it's not possible. Now, now look. <laughs> so, he said that on his TV, on his television show, on his broadcast, right? And there were all kinds of uh, reactions from the press, government, citizens, and all this kind of stuff. Um, 
and they were asking him to, to, to not talk about that so much because they were afraid of the consequences, you know, they might try to kill him and all this kind of stuff, right? So it became a big deal. The press amped it up, right? So the witches, the witches' response and their boast was this. Not even God can stop it. This is this what one particular witch said. I'm a wizard, and I know the power we carry. He said, not even God can stop it. Because cause, he a wizard, and I know the, I'm a wizard, and I know the power we carry. God can't even, not even God can stop it. All right? So, when Adahosi heard that, he said, yes, he's correct. Adahosi replied after he received the, the response from the wizard. He said, that's why I'm here. He said, uh, he said, God doesn't have to waste his time considering matters as trivial as stopping the conference of witches. He basically, he said, God ain't got to handle this. I'm going to handle this. <laughs> so the press went on. Uh, they, they, so now they, 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 they decided, okay, well, let's host this thing on TV. Let's get you, Bishop Idaho, and the, and the wizard, uh, on TV and, 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 and had this thing, uh, live, right? So they, the day came and they had it. Uh, both parties agreed. And, uh, so the, the wizard guy, he went first, right? And, uh, he started doing incantations in different languages and, you know, quoting from their own scriptures, right? And, you know, he doing all of this stuff, doing his, his witch, his witch doctor stuff, right? So after he, after he finished, um, Ida Jose asked, how much time do I have? The news anchor replied, five minutes, right? This is what Ida Jose said to the witch doctor, to the wizard. He said, the word of God said, suffer no witch to live. Now, if you claim to be a witch, it means you're going to die. And then he turned to ask him, are you a witch, yes or no? The witch doctor said, no. <laughs> no, not me. I ain't no witch. Did you hear that? He quoted Exodus. I think Exodus chapter 22, I think, verse 18. The word of God says, suffer no witch to live. He, so, so the guy did all his stuff, his response, his response from God, from the word. Oh, okay. The word says, suffer no witch to live. Which means if you're a witch, you're going to die. Yes or no? You're a witch? Oh, no, 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 not me. Not today, I ain't. And the conference was canceled. They didn't have it. So you, so when he, when he initially said, uh, no, that can't be true, that they're going to have a conference. Why? Because it's impossible. Why is it not impossible? Because he was, he was jacked up on what God said, suffer no witch to live. So anybody claiming to be a witch in his presence, <laughs> you was going to die. And he punked him down. He said, now that's what the word of God say. I'm saying what the word of God say. What you say, you're a witch, yes or no? No, not me, homie. I ain't no witch. I'm converted. <laughs> my point, though, my point is God needs believers, ministries, congregations. He needs corporate bodies of worship, houses of worship, right, to come to that place of understanding concerning our dominion and authority. Why? So that we can respond on God's behalf in the face of evilness like this. Because the, we're here to dictate to the world what is right and just, not, not have the world dictate to us. So, you know, I'm thinking, man, where was the church when they did it the year before in, 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 in Chicago? I mean, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that to put any churches down because, I mean, we, we as believers have had stuff go on right under our nose when we have authority over it and, and, and oversight. There's nothing contrary to the will of God going on in our lives that we don't have dominion over. 
that we can't put a stop to and change if we'll just get before God long enough to hear what to say and do. And then stay with it long enough to where we believe it to where we actually say and do it. We can turn it all around. We can turn it all around. 